welcome to another short tutorial with me, Carl Mitchley of the Tent Essex Living History Group, based in the UK. Today we're going to be looking at caps and helmets, okay? We're not going to be making any distinction between nationalities, so we're not going to be looking at Scottish or Irish headdress, we're just going to be looking at the headdress of the majority of the British Army during the Great War. So, without any further ado, let's get started. Here we have the 1905 pattern service dress cap. It uses the same cloth as the service dress jacket and trousers. The band is formed of stiffened buckram, card and black oil skin, which is correctly known as American cloth. The peak is made from stiffened card and covered with green paper cloth. There are two eyelets for ventilation on either side of the cap. Inside, the originals were lined with American cloth and the leather adjustable chin strap is attached by two small general service buttons, as you can see here. Now this does not have the American cloth liner as it is a reproduction made by Richard Knight of Khaki and Campaign. And if you are looking at doing living history or reenactment and you want a service dress cap, I suggest you get them from him because they are the best available. Also, in the top, there is a stiffening wire in the crown, which gives it its smart, distinctive shape. This is the Cap Winter service dress. It was introduced in November 1914 to provide warmth at the expense of its appearance. It was nicknamed the Gore Blimey, which was apparently uttered by NCOs when seen for the first time across the parade square. What it lost for in looks and smartness, it made up for in functionality. The neck curtain could be pulled down, like so, over the ears and worn a bit like a balaclava. It had a woolen chin strap, adjustable chin strap, so you could adjust it to hug the face that folded over the top of the cap, over the crown, like so, when not in use. No stiffening wire was in the, there was no stiffening wire in the crown or cardboard in the peak, which gives it its floppy shape, enabling it to be stuffed in a pocket or pack. The crown was padded with wool fiber lined with shirt material and a spiral of stitches holds the padding in place. In December 1914, a waterproof cap cover was introduced for the Gore Blimey, constructed from lightweight khaki cotton, coated on the inside with a thin layer of natural rubber. It has a neck curtain for protection. Okay, so here we have the neck curtain in the folded position, and tied up. This could be undone to protect the back of the neck from rain or even strong sunshine. It also has two ties to tie the neck curtain up when not in use or to tie under the chin when it is in use. The Gore Blimey was officially withdrawn from use in early 1916. Brodie's steel helmet wore off his pattern. This was known as the tin hat, the trench hat, or the battle bowler to the troops. In the summer of 1915, the War Office in London were coming to the conclusion that some form of steel helmet was required to protect from falling shell splinters, rocks and soil thrown up during artillery bombardments. So I looked at and evaluated the French Adrian helmet, but decided it was too complex. An inventor named John Leopold Brodie devised a helmet that was easy to manufacture and cheap to make. Two experimental patterns evolved. The first pattern was known as the Type A and the second pattern known as the Type B. After evaluation and recommendation, the Type A won and became the steel helmet wore off his pattern, which this is a copy of. Made from hardened manganese steel, it had a padded interior made from felt. Now it's not easy to see, but in there, that kind of beige crown pad that is the felt padding. 
It also had a crown cradle made up of six tongues of American oil cloth and a support band into which was set 12 rubber buffers. This is the support band and here we have the rubber buffers set into that. The chin strap was a two piece construction and attached to the chin strap bales of the helmet shell like so. Okay, so they're attached to the chin strap bales. And as you can see, it's just done up in a similar way to a belt around the chin or placed around the back of the head. In April 1916, it was decided to introduce an improved liner and chin strap and also to fit a four metal rim around the edge. The improved liner consisted of an oval crown pad, which is under, let's move that chin strap out of the way, which is under here and under its original label. And this pad was made from lint, asbestos and felt. It was fixed in the apex with a copper rivet, which can be seen just by my finger. But it's also fixed by a leather strap through the actual chin strap bales. Okay, can't see, but it actually runs through the chin strap bales, which means it's fixed, the liner is fixed to the helmet at three points, the copper rivet and the chin strap bales. A one piece adjustable chin strap was added and a metal rim added to the edge to prevent cuts and gashes in the close confines of the trench. Often soldiers in the tight confines would walk past each other and gash themselves on the sharp edges of the earlier raw edge Brody helmet. Formal approval was given for the new steel helmet, the Mark I as it was now known, in the first week of July 1916. From June 1917, it was decided a rubber ring should be added under the crown pad to offer more protection to the head. So a rubber ring would have was introduced from, 1970, from June 1917 under that felt asbestos and lint crown pad. Also, helmet covers were introduced. Okay, Normally made out of cotton or hessian. Sandbags were often used, often made just behind the lines and improvised. They are placed over the helmet to eliminate shine off the paint from the helmet. It tended to shine in bright sunlight or in moonlight. This cuts down on that, but it also offers a bit of camouflage protection as well. Here we have the trench cap or the cap soft service dress. As the helmet was introduced, so was a new cap, first approved in March 1916. It was similar in appearance to the 1905 service dress cap it was designed to replace. It was designed to fold easily so it could be placed in a pocket or a pack. It had a stitch peak for strength. Early ones had an American cloth liner, like so. It also had, the headband was originally made from silver grey shirt material. However, in November 1917, they were seen to be made completely from American cloth. That's the headband and the crown liner. In December 1917, garbadine caps were introduced. And in March 1918, the lining and the sweatband tended to be completely made out of cotton. So there we have it the caps and the helmets of the British soldier during the Great War. I hope you've liked this video. If you have, please like below. If you have any comments, please place them in the comments box below. And please, if you so wish, please subscribe to this channel. Thanks for watching.